great to have uh, our next edition of uh, conversations with capita and uh, today again we have a super exciting uh, conversation lined up for all of you uh, and with a great set of i would say experts and practitioners um, and today uh, and we broadly look at you know uh, obviously we are uh, into equity and esops uh, we broadly look at you know uh, uh, talent and you know how to attract retain talent and today we are going to delve into a very very um, uh, a unique element of how to actually build talent right um, and i think um, it's a truism to say that you know that talent is the perhaps the biggest differentiator i think as startups and entrepreneurship in general is mushrooming across the globe and you know capital is becoming more democratized um, and you know you know startups are there everywhere i think it's uh, the the ability to bring together talent which maybe differentiates um, a company or you know that that talent is slowly becoming the strategic advantage that you know a company has um and uh, many companies are looking to grow and build talents uh, their, their own talent pool in different ways right so how do how do these companies look at building this that rockstar team that will take them to that growth journey they aspire for right and are there options beyond perhaps their perceivable horizons and literally in some sense in this discussion uh, that uh, you know hiring managers founders etc can explore right so to have this discussion we have uh, yamini so we have yamini jain co-founder of glow roots uh, who's also a close partner to capita so we'll talk more about that and we have uh, richi richi khandelwal uh, who is also the co-founder of rice labs um, who is also uh, you know uh, have been uh, exploring glow roots so we'll also talk about how what is the value that uh, um, uh, and uh, how uh, richi is also looking to build uh, his talent pool uh, for uh, growing rice labs right so yamini and richi wonderful to have you both and have you shared your experiences welcome how how are you both doing thank you so much for having us shrikant uh, go ahead richi go for it yamini um thanks a lot for having us shrikant uh, i think this is a conversation that needs to be happen uh, that needs to happen again and again i'll quickly introduce myself uh, and then start the, pave the way for richi i'm yamini one of the co-founders of glow roots glow roots helps companies you know build global remote teams so whenever you think of a cross border employment situation everything related to the employee life cycle from onboarding payroll benefits taxes glow roots has your back so we genuinely believe that true talent is spread across the globe and companies and talent should leverage each other for that in today's time introducing richi here who is our dearest and most uh, important customer uh, talk let's talk to him about how his journey has been thank you so much yamini um, not sure if i'm the most important but dearest i will take uh, uh, <laughs> any day thank you so much uh, hey guys my name is richi i'm one of the founders at Price Labs. Uh, Price Labs is a dynamic pricing solution for uh, for hospitality industry. We started on the short term rental side, which uh, is often colloquially referred to as Airbnb, right? So we started on that side. We do dynamic pricing. We are the guys who, if you're trying to book, uh, and if you don't book today and you book tomorrow and you see the prices go up, we are the folks who are uh, changing in the background where the if the prices are going up or prices are going down, right? Um, so so that's what we do. Um, we've been doing this for uh, nearly a decade now um and um and uh, i'm very excited to have this conversation because yes 110% agree that uh, uh the last four uh, words on this teams to accelerate growth uh, is an absolute absolute like uh, it's an imperative for any business uh, to do that wonderful thanks thanks yamini and richi for those introductions uh, wonderful to engage in this conversation uh, i think we'll like, just pick up from where richi ended right like uh, the importance of talent uh, even in my earlier remark i mentioned you know how it is becoming the the maybe the top priority competitive advantage or the top priority of many com- companies founders cxos mds uh, to build their uh, you know leadership and then obviously the overall talent and their culture right uh, so i i like to i like both of you to kind of weigh in on this point further like do you actually believe this you know talent being the big major differentiator in these organizations slated for success or ones that are already successful and uh, also you know how have you gone about building your own talent pool in your respective organization so maybe start at a little bit of a high level you know on this and let's get into your example your companies so maybe uh, richi you want to go first and then maybe amini on this sure uh, i can uh... see i mean um, there are various kinds of organizations and uh, and depending on what your organizational strength is uh, like you have to you have to identify that for for companies like us which are like very 
like purely tech, right? We don't have any assets. We don't have any manufacturing sites. We're not uh, building anything, right? Uh, so our absolute, uh, like the, the only asset that we really have is people, right? Um, <clears throat> so it's it's extremely important to, to build uh, an organization that uh, relies on those assets deeply. And in order to do that, you want to have talent that is like uh, absolutely fantastic, right? And 110% uh, and uh, time and again, uh, uh, from what I've read, now I'm not experienced enough, uh, although I have a white hair in my beard now, but not experienced enough. Um, like a lot of great people talk about this, right? Like you can't you can't build a very good company without very good talent, right? And so 110 uh, percent uh, for most successful organizations, uh, talent is always uh, going to be a differentiator, especially in the world that we live in now, right? Uh, where it's so much easier to ship, it's so much easier to uh, to uh, to get things done. Uh, knowledge is at your fingertips, right? So that the arbitrage uh, for everything is so little, like. There could have been an arbitrage maybe 20 years ago, right? Where only a few people knew about something right. and only those people had learned it, right? But now there's no arbitrage, right? Uh, like the the moats for companies are coming down, right? Everything uh, 20 or 10 right. years ago, maybe investors would ask you, hey, so what's your real moat, right? And you'd come up with all of these fancy answers. But I think the real moat today is your talent, uh, right? Uh, everything else can be copied. Uh, talent and culture. Perfect, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Definitely. I think a lot of things are getting table stakes and uh, I think talent becomes that differentiator. But yeah, Yamini, why don't you uh, talk about your experience about this? I think you are in the business of that. So, yeah. No, Richie stole my line. I, we didn't even rehearse it together. But I was about to say that talent is the truest moat that companies really have. Uh, you know, every today talent across every geography is building for the global world. They are very, very talented. They have the perspective. They understand the global customer. They understand uh nuances that are that are not limited to geography anymore right so when everybody's building great products talent is all you have so in terms of competitive advantage that companies build like even if you go historically culture has been a competitive advantage right culture comes from the teams and the talent you build build in so a combination of this is the truest advantage you can build in today's time uh so if you like talk about product features, right, it's like plus minus six months ahead and behind for everyone in the world. But a true team like remains true to itself. Like if you just look at this cliched example of open AI, right, <laughs> it's quite dramatic. But like if you look at it, how the team stood up for Sam Altman and said that, OK, I'm going to be there if you're going to be there. I mean, there is no other testimony of true progress and growth, if not that. I mean, that's actually a very, very timely example, right? I mean, we are seeing that play out uh, very, very <laughs> evidently. Uh, and yeah, I think that's a wonderful uh, example, Yamini, on how, 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 how talent is actually driving uh, uh, a lot of the boardroom, uh, you know, aspects and even beyond boardroom, you know, in some sense in that. Uh, so great. I think uh, Richie and uh, Yamini, a great, great uh, intro into uh, where talent and that's obviously we know the answer in some sense, but, you know, coming from these experiences, it helps. Uh, and drive the you know, next set of uh, discussion on actually now uh, now that you know we have established that talent is the moat and is perhaps one of the big factors in driving success of uh, growth seeking organizations and uh, the the likes of which you know we we represent in some sense um can the also two of you talk about the importance of exploring different pools of talent and uh, you know this is where I mean, this was a revelation to me also as i was talking to yamini earlier of where all you know global pools of talent is available and why you know we don't need to be constrained uh, by the you know areas or um, uh, you know context in which we are operating right now, right? So, uh, what, what, why do you think uh, it's important to kind of explore or broaden our horizons uh, with with these you know global pools of talent and uh, what is the efficacy of employing these global teams? So maybe again, uh, Richie, you can start with your experience and then maybe Yamini can bring a broader perspective working with many organizations. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, tapping into global pool of talent is is not a new thing right companies have been doing it for several decades right uh, but uh, i would say that uh, maybe back in the day maybe 20 years ago maybe maybe longer right um, 
tapping into a global talent pool was something that large companies would do, right? So like uh, an IBM would say, okay, now I have a center in in uh, US, but now I want to build a center in uh, India, and then I want to build a center somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because they wanted to tap into global talent pool, makes uh, hiring easier. You're able to find very, very high quality people, right? Without, without, uh, uh, without negotiating on the bar of uh, where you want to hire people at, right? Um, and so, so uh, tapping into global talent is something that's been happening forever, right? Um, uh, with with large companies. And then about, I want to say maybe a decade ago or so, you started seeing some of these other companies uh, spring up like GitHub and the likes, right? Who who really took this uh, remote world and when once you're in the remote world, uh, like then you can hire anywhere, right? Because uh, all three of us, we're sitting in different offices today, right? But we can have this conversation, right? And then... Uh, this was uh, further uh, uh, increased only by uh, like COVID, right? Once COVID happened, all of us were sitting at home and then you can like, then you can, all of us are boxes on a computer screen, right? So we can very easily tap into talent uh, from anywhere. Um, as you as you think about that, uh, along that landscape, what also happened was the reason why uh, only large companies could access global talent was because accessing global talent was extremely expensive. Right? You had to build this office somewhere. You had to take care of all of these uh, uh, compliances, et cetera, et cetera. And that doesn't exist anymore, right? Like, I, like there are there are several uh, things, and uh, we'll we can talk about it later uh, in this conversation. But as you as you go about doing that uh, now, uh, thanks to not thanks to, but maybe perhaps thanks to COVID, right? We have we have a lot of technology that's that's come about that makes it relatively easy to run a, a talent pool from anywhere. Right now, uh, if you can run a talent pool from anywhere, right, uh, why limit it to only a certain geography? Why not just tap the globe uh, for the talent that you're looking for? Right. And it, it has uh, several advantages to it. Right. If you think about it, because all of us probably have to have uh, somewhere or the other read, there is an advantage to have diversity in your team. Right. Uh, somewhere. Or the other. And if you can if you can tap into that, uh, why would you not? Right. Um, so, yeah. Um, so so that, so that. So I think like uh, that global talent pool is important. Uh, it makes it it makes it easier to hire the people at certain bar wherever you want to hire. Just increases your global talent pool, right? Uh, increases the diversity in your team and uh, makes work just so much more uh, fun, right? Um, like a lot of us have uh, uh, want to travel, right? Uh, but you get to see you don't get to see travel from your just your your uh, colleagues that live nearby you now uh, at least in price labs like our most trending posts on uh, slack are uh, personal travels uh, around the world right so those are the most trending trending uh, things right so you can you can leverage uh, all of that uh, so so why not i think definitely uh, i think I, there's a yeah, yeah. go ahead yeah. i could have said it better myself uh, just to build on the point of building centers right like earlier there wasn't a way to build global teams without building centers. And that made that made sense only when a mass number of people need to be hired from a particular location, right? In today's time, I always advise my clients and discuss with them that if you want to build a center, make it for a strategic reason. You know, make it if you want to set up a manufacturing hub or make it if you're getting some advantages from the government. Or, or find a reason beyond building global teams to set up your entities and locations right in today's time if you build if you want to just build global remote teams to leverage the talent that there is it has become so simple that you just need like to click on a form and say submit and the hire is ready to get onboarded um why like like if you look at prize labs right they're spread across at least six to eight geographies and the talent ranges from product, tech, designers, customer support, marketing. Uh, it's its a wide range. A company needs all functions to survive, right? Now, when we are going deeper and deeper into understanding global talent and accessing them, we are able to also leverage their true strength of geographies that come into picture. It's, it's, no, it's a no-brainer that new talent comes with different perspective different speed to action, different relationships in subcontext of the location, right? And they, when they all come together to build a global product, it has a higher defensibility without a doubt. Now, if you look at uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan, 
I'm not even entering India in this conversation right now. Uh, Nigeria. These are really upcoming countries when you talk about engineering talent. Okay, beginning engineering talent. You talk about uh, sales, right? Southeast Asia is really up there when you talk about global sales. Take Latam for example. Similarly, if you look at um, new corridors that are building, right? Like say UAE is one of the corridors that are building. Companies are now able to build talent base across any of these centers and leverage the competence that the geography has owned over the years. And when you combine that with a global team, it you really become a, a defensible product in that sense. So companies were building global teams earlier, only the rich and mighty could, but in today's time, everybody can. It's just about expanding your mind to see that, am I able to, you know, explore those trenches? I mean, COVID is the global's biggest beta test that can ever be done, right? Has anyone ever done a beta test at the level that COVID has done? So who are we even to question whether it will work or not? Wonderful. I think really amazing points from both of you. I think, yeah, definitely COVID was that inflection point in some sense, you know, uh, testing this whole uh, new order in some sense of, you know, uh, working uh, maybe in a forceful way, right? Uh, working remotely. And I think that has opened up these possibilities. I think, I mean, actually, my next question was on this only. And in a way, you partly answered that, right? Like uh, uh, talking really about this whole supply side of equation, you know, uh, where, where do we get what? And I think a lot of what you just said was quite a revelation to me also. Uh, like looking at Southeast Asia, maybe with the sales focus or, you know, um, and there are obviously different kind of competencies at different geographies historically because of the way you know, businesses have evolved in those uh, geographies. Uh, but my, my question again, and maybe Richie, you can also add on to that from your uh, experience uh, as a founder, uh, where have you tapped in? What kind of pool of talent, you know, uh, that would be wonderful for uh, the listeners because you can assume there are a lot of founders listening in. So uh, perhaps this is a very new concept to many of them. So how can they actually learn from your journeys or learn from your experience? Um, and also one question I have maybe here is also, is there a significant quality arbitrage when you're actually, you know, employing, because we talked a lot about arbitrage, right? So employing talent in different geographies, how would you, uh, you know, really talk about it? Because that's what will be a tipping point to make these decisions in the first place, right? So maybe, Richie, first on uh, your experience on uh, sourcing this good pools of talent, where have you sourced it from and what, what are the different job definitions or roles? And uh, how do you really define the quality arbitrage? And maybe, I mean, you can add further to what you just said. Personally, I don't know if there is a real quality arbitrage, uh, so to speak, right? Because you can find high quality people in most geographies, right? Um, but uh, what what does help is, for example, for our business, we are a 24-7 business, right? For us to be able to uh, run 24-7 table stakes, right? We need to cover 24-7, right? And uh, as a result of that, um, we could do two things. We could have... Uh, in uh, one geography running 24 hour shifts right or we could find multiple geographies uh, that was that was one of the first reasons why we why we uh, started looking out right uh, because uh, what we did find was if we wanted to run 24 hour shifts from one geography um, the talent pool in certain time zones uh, was not as great right of course like uh, like uh, great talent will do graveyard shifts maybe a year two year right but not not forever right um so uh so so that so that was that was one of the first reasons why we started looking out right um and so so uh we have we have a, a decent sized team in philippines we have a decent sized team in india uh, we have a decent sized team in europe for support and uh we're now also looking at latin america for support right um now that's not to say <clears throat> there is like uh, any quality arbitrage across all four right uh, we get we get similar quality right uh, but we are able to uh, because we are able to provide uh, and work in great time zones right we are able to find a uh, great talent for uh, for a role that uh, that most people uh, struggle to find great talent for right and uh, uh, secondary to it but uh, for us uh, having customer support is is very very crucial because we think like if you can serve customers really well you can uh, you can then uh, like it's a flywheel 
if you serve customers well they'll get you more customers right and so uh, so if we, if i can have great talent there uh, then why not right so so that's that's number one and then from there then you start thinking about okay if i am going to go to market um if i can get uh, local people in various various geographies and we are a global business we have customers around the world right and if i can get uh, local team members uh, to sell in those geographies uh, it makes uh, a lot of the conversation easier and so why not do that right yeah. and uh, then uh, when when it comes to uh, tech and product right that's a little bit of a more uh, uh, difficult thing and and something that we have actually honestly not fully cracked right because uh, okay. there the advantages of uh, global talent are not as easily realized at least for us today right on the go to market side it's very very uh, clear right on the on the tech side we're starting to realize on on some ends right for example uh, qa and on call right um, again similar situation as support right uh, if we can solve for that right um, but there are there are certain places where we where we do see advantages for example there are certain geographies uh, if you'd google you'd find this but certain geographies that do a very good job on ui and front end right um and so so it's right. like you have you have a readily available uh, pool on that right um there are certain geographies that uh, can uh, are like just better at design and communication yeah. right uh, maybe maybe it's because of uh, the inherent nature of how they've been brought up right but uh, but so 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 there are there are those advantages right but uh, for us it effectively started from being able to support uh, customers globally having said that we were always too short right we were always uh, we had uh, we had three founders two of us were in us and i was in india so uh, so we always had uh, a too short model uh, anyway got it got it yeah, yeah, I mean, why don't you add to this? Uh, but it's great to see that pattern, right? First, you focus on the GTM, which is the easier decision in some sense or more obvious because you want your customer facing teams to be closer to your customers. While I think product and team is more strategic and uh, I'm sure Yamini will add more there. I, I heard some, you know, some insights from her earlier as well. So Yamini, why don't you talk about the supply side? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, actually what Richie said covers one of the use cases that companies you know, have when they're building global teams. Similarly, other companies have multiple reasons to build global remote teams. Uh, what I was talking about earlier was about how supply helps with certain qualities of talent in terms of like speed to action or uh, time, time zone effect or uh, like, like Richie was able to leverage the time zone effect, right? So different right. geographies have different strengths that build up. Uh, Historically, if you look at 10 years back, India was the go-to place for tech, tech talent, right? It today is also. But similarly, there are other hubs coming up for similar such talent. Like customer success has historically been, uh, let's say, Philippines, Indonesia thing. It still is. But there is, there are more centers coming up to take up these roles, right? And like, uh, like Richie also said, right, just because they've been brought up in a certain way, the skill... Uh, improvement happens at a much faster pace. Now, uh, somehow, translators are very much uh, popular in India. Like, there are much more translators in India because the ability to talk in multiple languages comes naturally. So there are, like, it's it's a difficult, like, detailed study. But to say that certain geographies mm. build certain kind of skills is not a, is a, is a no-brainer, right? Now, companies who are building global teams have to cater to global customers across multiple time zones and build for the global uh, audience. So building the, picking up the right kind of supply from the right kind of geography helps them reach their goals of go-to-market, of product development pace, of uh, building a, a price sensitivity that helps you know, with the uh, eventual sale. So combination of all of this works well. And I mentioned a few geographies for certain competencies, but these geographies and competencies right. are much faster than we can cover in this conversation. So, yeah, yeah. companies. When, I, I'm sure you guys, yeah. Sorry, sorry, please complete your point. Yeah. I'm saying that exactly when companies are building out global talent, they are mindful of the fact that which talent helps them with which kind of skill set and which should be catered from which geography. And we are also like actively able to help companies, you know, define that. Yeah, uh, no, I'm sure you guys have a ready database uh, already, right, of uh, what competencies and uh, perhaps what is the most, uh, both quality-wise and cost-wise, mo most efficient way to source that talent globally. 
uh, perhaps that's that's what you advise companies on as well. Uh, and I also heard like, for example, within engineering, you said you know gaming uh, engineers are concentrated in a particular geography. I think you mentioned that yesterday. So I'm, I mean, those are very very insightful nuances. I'm sure people listening in uh, can reach out to you uh, based on their strategy, you know, their uh, their larger objectives and how that can align to their team building efforts. Um, and just just an admin announcement. I, I see there are uh, I think one question. Uh, I'll take that up later. But uh, the 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 LinkedIn chat is available. So in case you are, you have any questions for Yamini and Richie, uh, please please uh, you know do type that in, and we'll kind of take that up. If it is very contextual to the question, we'll take that up then, or we can take it up take that up uh, a little later. Um, so I just wanted to move on, and we uh, we understand that you know quality perhaps uh, can be so. But uh, for example, in Richie's case, it was more geographical that you know those decisions were made. In some cases, you can also focus like this gaming example. I, I'm sure there might be a different competency in a different geography, so that makes sense. But I think one common underlying thread is the cost arbitrage, right? And I'm, I'm assuming a lot of those decisions are also made, uh, uh, you know, keeping in mind the cost aspects as well. Uh, so, uh, w what has your experience been, uh, uh, Richie? Uh, I know that most of your decisions are more for ensuring you know your customer-facing teams are closer. But is there a cost aspect as well of you know hiring global teams, taking some of these decisions, and maybe I mean you can add a more broader perspective uh, on this as well. See, if I was a US company, there is a very clear arbitrage, right? Uh, right, uh, because the salaries in US are are uh, significantly higher than anywhere else in the world, right? But outside of US, uh, <clears throat> I don't think there is a material cost arbitrage in any other geography, right? Um, like from India, I don't necessarily see a cost arbitrage, right? Um, for the like for like talent, right? Maybe <clears throat> maybe 10, 20 percent, 30 percent here or there, but then you probably lose it on uh, uh, trying to communicate, trying to set up uh, various uh, processes, etc., etc. Right? So I don't know if there is a mm. real cost arbitrage conversation uh, to be had at, at least personally i haven't seen right um but uh, uh, unless unless you are a us company uh, got it got it uh, yamini why don't you share your perspective on this i think you pretty much covered it uh, if there is talent unavailable in a country that talent is going to be expensive it's yeah. it's how the law of supply and demand works in countries where there is additional supply of a particular type of talent it is probably uh, more affordable for the companies to you know build a team there end of day companies think of these decisions more from a quality of competence point of view also yeah. but yes if you're a us company cost arbitrage is an advantage to you yeah. it's a simple law of law, supply and demand yeah. i i would say though like uh, in terms of quality arbitrage there are there are certain uh, uh, certain things that uh, some geographies do really really well at right um, for example uh, this, is, this is a example that i quote often i wouldn't name the role that we were hiring for but for a certain role that we were hiring for uh, in india we'd only get generalists right uh, we wanted a specialist in that role right but because of uh, part of how that role is perceived in India or the culture of it or the culture of uh, teams, etc. right? This is a, a marketing kind of a role, right? Um, uh, but uh, we, we'd rarely get specialists in India. We'd just get generalists because uh, that role was just seen as a stepping stone to next role, right? And so people won't really dive in deeper, right? Uh, whereas in Europe, we'd get like specialists who've like spent 10, 15 years in it and uh, like they uh, come in and immediately bring value. Um, they're of course uh, paid paid accordingly as well, right? Yeah. Um, and we were willing to pay accordingly in India, but we did not find that person uh, because perhaps the market was not willing to pay for, for the same role, right? Um, so, uh, so, so that happens a lot more than uh, the cost arbitrage, I would say, right? Um, which is sometimes, sometimes mm. we end up paying more for a certain role, but because we're able to find that role, because the geography has not supported uh, those kind of roles, right? Uh, and how the geography pays has not supported mm. those kind of roles, if that makes sense. Right? The other, the other, so that's very, um, yeah. The other thing that I would yeah, say, go ahead, go ahead. sorry, <laughs> is uh, uh, one of the other things that we find uh, every geography uh, has, a, uh, like India has the advantage of uh, having a young population, right? So you can tap into a lot of fantastic talent pool, right? Uh, but it also has the disadvantage of uh, like 
all of us start super early right and especially now in this uh, startup world all of us uh, like the number of messages that we get at uh, people who are uh, 21 year old and are like i want to be a product manager right or i want to be hired as a product manager right um, and uh, nothing wrong there right and nothing wrong with that aggressive uh, mindset right uh, but sometimes for deep work you just need experience right and so in some geographies for example in europe we're able to find uh, some uh, that deep work ethic a little bit better because they've, they've spent their first uh, 10 years uh, traveling the world, back backpacking around the world, right? And then once they've decided, okay, now I'm going to work, they're ready to just sit down and work, right? They're like, no, <laughs> uh, like I just want to do deep work, right? And so, 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 so that helps uh, in in certain geographies and certain roles. And so, so that's kind of how we uh, think about it, and less so on the cost arbitrage side. Got it. No, that was very insightful. In fact, I think the earlier example you gave. Uh, like I mean, like this being generalist and stepping stone to the next role. I think maybe sourcing the right talent from the right job. Like in this case, example you mentioned, Europe might also help in uh, uh, arresting attrition, right? Like uh, given that you know maybe uh, uh, the geographies they come from, you know, there's a different trajectory of career pathways, uh, which might be more suitable for the kind of you know uh, uh, teams you would want to eventually build, right? Uh, uh, with less churn in some sense. Is that a, is that a right? Uh, assessment to achieve in your uh... that's, that's fair yeah that's fair like so for example uh, uh, like uh, and probably Yamini knows this very very well I'm not sure uh, Shrikant how much time you've spent on the people side of things but like uh, if you think about uh, a career ladder for a technical person right we very very we every every company will have a career ladder for a technical person where you can be an expert or you can be an uh, a team lead right uh, but rarely would you see that right. on the GT side right uh, like very few companies have like an expert position, right, uh, on the GTM side, right, um, and so so that limits the talent development itself, right. Uh, so like if I want to find uh, a SEO who has twenty years of experience, say, or like a mark ops person who's who just wants to do mark ops really well, right, but has twenty years of experience, right. Um, uh, so few companies do that, but uh, that that arbitrage uh, across uh, globe allows us to find the right talent uh, that we are looking for for our company. No, perfect. This is really helpful. Um, so I think there's one question and maybe I will take it up now. Uh, so Abhishek asks, uh, how important is the synergy of talent and culture while onboarding a new joining? So I think I'm uh, bringing culture into the equation and maybe you can weigh in from this whole global talent perspective as well that we're discussing today. Maybe Richie, why don't you uh, yes, share your perspective absolutely. on this? Uh, like it's extremely important, right? Uh, especially like if you're going to build uh especially if you're at our scale uh, and like Yamini said, unless you're setting up centers, right? If you're at scale, at our scale, uh, we're going to uh, work out of these computer boxes, right? That all three of us are in, right? And in that, uh, right. you're, you're rarely going to see each other. You see each other uh, maybe once a year, two times a year or something like that, right? Um, in that kind of a scenario, like having uh, uh, the similar kind of folks, right? Now, uh, of course, uh, if you're hiring globally, certain things are going to be different right uh, for example of course uh, uh, indians are going to be late to meetings and that's okay right uh, and uh, certain geographies are going to struggle to communicate and that's okay right but at the at the uh, at the very fundamental level right uh, are your moral compasses in the right direction right um, are you are you kind are you empathetic right uh, do you uh, uh, yeah do, do do you not lie, right? Uh, when faced with adversity, how do you react, right? Uh, those kind of things are are more important, right? There, there are certain. Uh, There's a fantastic book called Culture Map, right? Which I would uh, recommend uh, anyone who's thinking about hiring globally uh, to read, right? It it lays out uh, like some things that we see as negatives in certain geographies to saying, oh, uh, we need to align across culture on, um, say. Uh, decision making or uh, even how you speak right um, I, I don't think you can do that because you have to accept those cultures from those geographies but there is probably a core set of uh, moral compass kind of uh, culture cultural values that you should uh, definitely align on wonderful i'm actually tempted to ask richie like do you like quantify especially in the context of global remote teams do you actually quantify this are there artifacts around this or this is more like a lived experience that you know uh, you know people are passing on to the 
new new joinees in some sense. So we, we especially in the context uh, of the remote teams, right? That's that's making it even more challenging, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think we're getting to the stage where we do need to codify it. A lot of it is tribal, right? Um, uh, I've done every single interview so far that we've hired at, right? So probably have uh, like we've hired uh, 150 odd people, and I've done every single interview, right? From uh, from any senior person that we've hired to every like even an intern, right? And so uh, so uh, we're able to be the tribal judge on like uh, with my tribal knowledge, be a judge on that. But we we do have codified uh, knowledge on what do we expect our uh, uh, our cultural values to be right, uh, or uh, then uh, even like in our performance management, then that that uh, plays a role as well, right? When we are interviewing, our team knows like certain uh, measures that we need to need to check on, etc. Right? So, uh, so yeah, so I th I think uh, no no hard artifacts today that uh, that I can uh, point to, but uh, it exists in a soft fashion today for us. Perfect, got it. And yeah, as you evolve, I think you'll. You know, you know, these things evolve as well. I think one uh, aspect I specifically wanted to ask Richie was uh, again wearing the hat of uh, the the founder, you know, who's who's built this remote teams and fairly early in your journey, I should say, right? Uh, so I'm sure there may be a lot of uninitiated founders, you know, who, who for them this is still a very new concept, right? Uh, um, like I said, it's opening horizons uh, in their mind in some sense also. So uh, for someone who's contemplating hiring or building their own talent, you know, how should they think about global talent? Um, uh, and they might actually be quite confused, you know, how, how can I actually, you know, hire in other job groups? And that's where I think Glow Roots comes, comes in as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, how should they start? You know, what are the aspects they need to think about? Of course, you there are so many nuances involved, right? Like legalities, compliances, local regulation, tax. Um, so maybe why don't you give the perspective of the founder, Richie, having done this? Of course, Glow Roots has helped you in this. Uh, but then maybe Yamini can also add further on to it, you know, yeah. I think as a founder, uh, okay. surely, right? Like, uh, we, uh, I remember we had tried to, uh, in a different company, we had tried to hire, um, back in 2017, uh, people across uh, geographies, right? And it, it was a little bit of a messy affair, right? Because you'd, uh, you'd hire the person, but in order to get them onboarded, and uh, there were, uh, there were these local, uh, uh, I'm, Yamini will have the right word for it, P -E -O or E O R, one of those uh, words, right? Uh, uh, organization that existed, right? Uh, but uh, it was difficult, right? Because every time you'd have you'd have to find a new one, it was a difficult conversation, right? Now, thanks to uh, uh, Gloroots, Yamini, and other similar companies, but Gloroots uh, is who we work with, uh, have built this fantastic platform that. Uh, the, the very basic need of all the compliances, etc., and I hope, uh, but uh, all the compliance, etc., we don't need to worry about it, right? Uh, so, uh, so Glow Roots will take care of that, right? Um, then comes the next layer. Okay, if uh, if now I don't have to worry about compliances, now can I open up uh, like my global hiring, uh, right? That is a fundamental uh, question that the business needs to ask themselves first, right? Do we even need it, right? Uh, if if there is like you need to fundamentally ask yourself right some like are we ready for it do we need it for uh, for in our case uh, uh, we were always a global business and uh, what ended up happening was one of our customers said hey i want to come work with you guys uh, can i right and so so that that started the the thread of uh, uh, us us then hiring globally right um, and thankfully uh, again like uh, Via Glorus, we were able to hire uh, hire them, right? So, so it makes makes the life easy. I think uh, thanks, Richie, for that word of confidence. And you don't have to hope everything's taken care of. <laughs> you can be rest assured. Uh, just to add to this, I think as a founder, one should only focus on two things: finding the right kind of talent for your company, no matter the location. Like that is key. And second is like focusing on your core strengths. That is building your product and your sales of your product, right? When, it, when you talk about compliance, payroll, taxes, benefits, you should definitely leave it to an expert who's managing it for different geographies for some time now. Uh, historically, companies have always outsourced legal work, right? And have always been comfortable with it. It's because they trust the legal expertise that comes with it. Similarly, when it comes to employment life cycle of compliance and payroll, it's always best left to the team who has expertise in managing it and one as your core like contribution should be in building the right person and the right team and building your product. That's the most advantages or good service you can do for your own company. 
I think well said, Yamini, uh, especially on you know leaving the job to experts in some sense. And I think Richie, uh, uh, I, I think great, you know, in terms of uh, leveraging you know solutions like this, which which means that you are actually focusing on more strategic aspects and kind of you know uh, leaving some of these. Uh, um, aspects which to, to the experts themselves. Uh, maybe one question I have, uh, maybe I mean this is more for you, uh, is actually on the topic of rewards and incentives, and uh, would want you to weigh in from the larger strategic perspective, working with many of these companies, right? Uh, because uh, again, here there are multiple, uh, and maybe you can also uh, start with the demystifying some of the terminologies like what EOR, AOR, and all those elements as well. But then uh, also then talk about rewards and incentives uh, again, uh, right? Uh, and uh, like how 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 does it work in this kind of a setup? Maybe you know where uh, you guys also play a role, right? Like being an employer on record and things like that. Um, and also uh, weighing on any stock based compensation. I mean, that's a sweet spot that we we come with as well. And we we obviously have perspectives on them. But how have you seen your discussion with founders? Because obviously some of these talent would be looked at from a long term perspective. It's not just a transactional you know freelance talent, but it's more strategic talent for the organization. And then maybe. Rewarding them with some of these long-term incentives, linking to the equity of the company, uh, might be uh, a discussion that uh, or an expectation on both sides in some sense. So, what have you seen? What do you hear there? What are some of the solutions you have come across? Um, would love to hear from you. So, yeah. Uh, definitely, I think I'll just quick, we should have clarified what EOR means in the first place. I think EOR Correct. is an employer of record in terms of full form. It essentially means that. We are the employer of record in the geographies that you're building your teams in. So think of us or that entity as an extended HR arm for your organization. They take care of everything employee related, onboarding the employees, managing their salary slips, their pay payroll service, their taxes, benefits, exit. So in a in a like to like scenario, we are the employer and the responsibility of the employees well-being, compliance and payroll is on us end to end. When Jamie, you talk how is about, that different from PEO? Yeah, I was just coming to that. Okay. When you talk cool. about PEO, which is a professional employer organization, that essentially means that you're a co-employer of the okay. employee. So you, and PEO is a more popular concept in the United States and not so much outside of it. But that Got means it. that you also have an entity in the location you're hiring the people, but you outsource the HR ops to a partner. So then that PEO organization becomes a co-employer who also handles everything, but the compliance responsibility end of day comes on the employer's head, which is the parent employer. Uh, so these are, this is the primarily the two difference uh, in the terms. And in the US, they are often used interchangeably, but outside of US, EOR is much more popular than a PEO. Right. I would uh, uh, I would plug this like it like all of those compliances seem like uh, it's okay we'll take care of it right uh, but they're they're a beast of their own right uh, mm -hmm. if you're an uh, uh, early stage founder uh, I think I think the the it's it's not it's not worth the headache uh, to think about uh, all of those compliances right especially when you have uh, specialists like uh, Yamini who can who can do that for you. Also, the speed of hiring, right, Richie? Like you were able to grow your team at such a fast pace because you just had to focus on hiring. So that makes a lot of difference, I think. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We, we're able to close out contracts much faster uh, or give offers much faster. Uh, yeah, like one hundred and ten percent, right? Um, but like speed of hiring, so like it's okay. Like we can solve for speed of hiring, right? We, we'll even create entities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? Whatever. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, like it's not our business to every day wake up and think about how to take care of compliance in a certain exactly. way. Exactly. Right? Uh, if you're doing that, uh, and and there are reasons, right? Like now, if now if I have hundred people in a geography, uh, that's a whole different story, right? I will want to do it, right? But if you have uh, five people in a geography. Uh, uh, it may not be may not be worth it. It's definitely not worth it, guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. Bring up on to Shrikant's question about rewards. So in today's uh, time, whatever benefits a traditional office going employee had, the same benefits and reward structure has been replicated for the global remote teams or the global teams, if I may say so. So when you talk about uh, perks like insurance, benefits like access to laptops or uh, uh, holiday offers, everything is replicated to the employee 
uh, to the remote employee. Uh, a key incentive to join startups and growing companies is stock rewards, right? There are multiple types of instruments that today help companies dole that out to the global teams. There are RSUs, there are RSAs, there's phantom equity, there's stock appreciation, there's multiple instruments that come. They come with their own uh, eligibility requirements and tax implications, but in terms of providing the employee with the satisfaction and the confidence that I want to give you my company's stock options because I believe in you and we'll grow together is possible in today's time. So essentially, there is no benefit or reward that is now not available to a remote employee as compared to a go-to office employee, let's say. Got it. No, that's quite good. And uh, yeah, I'd love to weigh in on the stock option side as well. But uh, the, uh, the, the other other benefits that you mentioned, Yamin, and you guys play a role in enabling that seamlessly for, for the, uh, for yes. like price lapses, right? So that way, they don't need to worry about the whole plumbing of you know how the you know benefits actually accrue. That's where I think low roots comes as well. So that's very I think that's very very helpful, right? Because you don't want a certain portion of your talent not getting the benefits which others get, right? So I think that that's that's a, a added point as well. And uh, I think of the stock options. Yes, I think uh, that there are definitely a variety of structures. Of course, there are constraints that jurisdictions place, uh, like. Like, for example, in India, you can't offer direct stock options to non-employees, but there are, you know, instruments which you can still give exposure to the you know, equity appreciation of the, through these appreciation rights and things like that. So I think definitely on a case by case basis, uh, a lot of solutions can be, you know, creatively, you know, uh, brought in as well. And of course, we, we, uh, that's where I think Capita and Glorus also partners, so, you know, we can offer these solutions to, to wider range of companies. Uh, in some sense, so I think we're coming to an end. I think uh, there are a couple of comments also on the on the chat. Uh, but then, uh, any um, uh, because coming towards the end of this discussion, I think very very insightful. I think I learned a lot from this uh, conversation. Uh, so maybe we can have like last last set of remarks from both of you. Uh, again, assume that there are a lot of founders or HR uh, personnel listening into this. So, um, what would be your kind of uh, you know um, uh, two cents to them? You know, in terms of uh, um, them building their teams and things like that and maybe you can weigh in also from what you guys can offer uh, things like that yeah. maybe uh starting with richie again and then yeah maybe. sure uh my ending remark is very very simple uh invest in capita and glow roots and then uh, <laughs> uh uh no but in all seriousness like both of like uh an esop management tool and uh and something like uh an EOR like Glow Roots uh, can be a fantastic uh, force multiplier, right? Um, so, so, so do do consider that um, your where we started from. Your talent talent is your truest moat. It's your biggest asset, and so uh, so figure out uh, how you can solve for it, right? Uh, you don't necessarily have to go global, but if if uh, global falls in your fundamental thesis of growing your company, um, why not? I think thank uh, you uh, richie thanks for the no, shout out as well yeah yeah really. no it doesn't need any uh, finishing remark uh, after what richie said uh, but just to add a line i would say that think deep and hard about growing global teams and when you do feel that uh, that you want to build one there are lots of options for you to explore so be aware of them and take a conscious like you know informed choice about how you want to build that Wonderful. On that note, I think uh, talent is the biggest moat. I think we started with that. I think we're ending with that as well. And I'm sure that the truism will last for uh, maybe decades to come as as uh, the world is opening up in some, uh, some sense. I think very, very insightful set of uh, things. So, like even I kind of opened up my mind into these possibilities after listening to this, uh, after engaging with Glow Roots over the last few days. So thanks for bringing this very you know, unique uh, element uh, to founders and, and HR teams you know looking to build out their rocket ships in some sense uh, and richie uh, thanks for actually you know talking from a very very practical lens and also useful tips to founders right as to what what should they focus on and what they better avoid not focusing on in some sense so thanks for bringing that up as well and yamini uh, it's a great partnership between capita and glow roots as well i'm sure there are many many teams we can impact uh, um, in, in 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 these uh, domains uh, so thanks uh, both of you for uh, making the time and uh, sharing your insights, sharing your experiences and uh, best practices. Uh, and we'll obviously come back with the next set of conversations and we'll keep this uh, tradition going on on all talent matters, on all equity matters and um, uh, related aspects. So 
thank you yamini again thank you richie for making the time and uh, have a good day both of you and thanks everyone bye, thank thanks you. for joining me bye, bye. bye. thank you